Desperation, I seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today.
Yes. Good morning, Coastline. It's so great to see you here today. We're excited to celebrate our risen Savior with you. If you were in the lobby or on our patio, I would just encourage you to go ahead and come in and find a seat. We have a great service plan, and we don't want you to miss a minute of it. Well, as we begin, I want to read uh, to us today from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. So today we get to celebrate the fact that we have a God who keeps his promises, and that we have a Savior who defeated uh, the grave so that we could celebrate the hope of eternal life with him. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could care?
Jesus name. Hear the shackles breaking free. Hear the song of the redeemed. He is moving. He is moving. He's alive. So take this freedom. Take this love. And we thank you for bringing us here today to just worship you and glorify your name, Jesus. We pray that you would have your way. We pray that you would speak mightily through your word. We just give this to you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Hey, let's try this real quick. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Um, so we had some of our students join us. Uh, we're going to have you guys dismissed to the lobby to go with your teachers, back to your classrooms. And then while that is happening, uh, I want to say happy Easter. We're glad you're here. Let's take a moment. Let's say hi to those around us.
Well, good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Becky, and I am here on staff at Coastline, and I just want to welcome you to our Easter service. We have been praying for you, and we have been praying for our time together this morning, so it is really our joy to see you here today and to be able to worship together with you. Um, In Mark chapter 14, uh, we have a story Jesus, this is a couple of days before Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion and death. And he is having dinner in the home of Simon the leper. And during that dinner, a woman comes in and she anoints Jesus' head with a really expensive jar of perfume. It's, it's such a lavish gift that the people that are there at the dinner, they don't understand why she would even do it. And so they begin to scold her. And Jesus says... Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing. She did what she could. And today, I want to encourage you that nothing you give to Jesus, your time, your talent, your treasure, none of it is wasted. The words, she did what she could, have stuck with me this week, and I've been meditating on them, and they have been permeating my thoughts. And so today, I want to encourage us together to consider what we can do for Jesus here at Coastline, here in our community, and our places of work, and our schools, because nothing that we do for him is ever wasted. And today, if you would like to make a financial gift to Coastline to help support our ministries and to help support what we are doing for Christ on our campus and through um, outside of our campus through our outreach partners, you can do that in several ways. You can give uh, online on our website. You can give via the Church Center app, and you can actually uh, drop a, a physical gift in the buckets. If you are seated next to a bucket, I would love it if you could just go ahead and pass it down the aisle, and you can go ahead and place a gift in that today. You can also place it in the boxes that we have have in the back. And as you're doing that, I want to tell you about our upcoming spring small group session. One of the things that we value here at Coastline is doing life together. And our small groups are a big part of how that happens. This is a place, small groups are a place for you to get connected with other people at Coastline, to do life together, to be encouraged in your faith, to learn about scriptures. And so we want to encourage you to be part of our small group ministry. Now, our spring session is starting the week of April 14th, and it's going to run for eight weeks. We have several groups that have openings and who are ready to welcome people. So if you would like to get plugged into a small group, you can do that through our Church Center app. If you don't have the app, you can download it for free on your phone. Uh, And then when it asks you to plug in your church, just uh, put in Coastline Bible Church. You'll actually be able to see uh, see what groups we have available. There'll be a brief description about them, and then you can request to join. Okay, so something else that is important to us at Coastline is recognizing and celebrating the life change that comes through a relationship with Jesus. And today we get the opportunity to celebrate that in a couple different ways. We're going to have baptisms uh, after the, the message, but today we also get to hear a faith story. And I want to invite Christina Bell up to the stage. She is going to share how Jesus has made a difference in her life. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Christina Bell. I am a wife and a mother of two. I was born here in Ventura, and I live literally down the street. I have been walking with God for six years now. I have a couple of brothers, and when I was seven years old, my parents got a divorce. Growing up with my mother and her boyfriend, I saw how her life was um, with drugs and alcohol, And with that came with neglect, physical and emotional abuse and abandonment. Um, I had no idea um, as a little girl what kind of value I had, especially as a daughter. Um, There was no stability in my home because we moved a lot and my mother was never really home um, or she would just leave us with our grandmother. Um, I did hate my mother at that time um, because of her choices. Now, fast forward, I was in my 20s and living in Los Angeles. I had been traveling a lot because I was a professional break dancer. Yes, break dancer. <laughs> um, um, but at my career, I did drink a lot. Um, my doctor would say, are you trying to kill yourself? And, and at that moment, I realized I don't want to kill myself with drinking. Um, 
yeah. Uh, so at that time, I was in a relationship that was very abusive. Um, he was into alcohol and a lot of cocaine and um, physically and emotionally abused me. And looking back, I can see how similar my life started to look like my mother's life. Uh, my boyfriend at the time, um, I was pregnant and he didn't want a child. Um, but it, I did, so I fought for her. Uh, my daughter's father said everything in the book to me. I hate you. How could you take my life away? Um, you ruined everything, you know. And I believed him because that's all I knew. And, you know, my mother hated me and my boyfriend. So how could, um, so how could, how, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I remember we had a horrible fight. I was hurt because he shoved me and I hid in the bathroom. And in the middle of the night and the light was off, I just cried to God. And I said, save me. And my daughter, and I, and I hated my life. Um, one time I drove to the PCH and at the rocks, I just stood there and I cried. And I said, um, I can't do this anymore. And I felt God was just pulling me back and saying, um, you know, keep going. That year I gave my life um, back to Christ. I was able to find an apartment and I start my, and start my new life and I had a new custody order and child support. I told myself I would never um, move or run away. I wanted to face my problems and give my daughter a stable home. Fast forward when I was 30, 33 years old now, I met my future husband on a music video set. <laughs> in Los Angeles, and we started um, dating, and I fell in love. I thought to myself, okay, Christina, don't mess this up. <laughs> but uh, while we were dating, uh, something would always come up in our relationship, and that was anger. I wish I could say I was perfect, but I wasn't. I was still dealing with my past. I, could get ups I would get upset over practically everything and not understanding why. So I asked God to reveal what was going on. I prayed hard, and I fasted. From that, God helped me find a great therapist. It was a believer in Christ that helped me see what was going on with my life. During that time, I learned I was depressed. I had slight PTSD, abused, neglected, had a lot of trauma, and um, I was raped in my 20s. And I never processed any of this in my life, and, I was, and it was bleeding into my new relationship with Robert and my daughter. So this anger, this sadness I had stored in, my, in myself since I was a child was ready to be healed. And let me tell you, it was the most terrified, best decision I have ever made in my life because God was there to hold my hand and heal me. God began the healing process. God has given me a man who was stable to be patient, understanding, and showed unconditional love with strong boundaries. He is compassionate. He helped me and loved me where I was, wasn't able to love myself in brokenness. I love my daughter, like, and, and he loved my daughter like if it was his own. God gave me a beautiful daughter who gave me a role as a mother to fight for her, to protect her when my mother couldn't fight for me or protect me. But God taught me how to do that. Last year, God blessed my husband and I with a beautiful baby boy so I can tell him how great God is. I can tell my children how God gave me value in my life. And how God loved me so much, he died for me to save me. My life isn't perfect, but God has given me hope in him. Instead of clapping for me, clap for him, because he saved me. I love you, God.
That's my fault. That was totally, that was a rookie move right there. Let me try that again. Happy Easter. <laughs> Hey, my name's Neil. I'm the lead pastor here at Coastline. It is great to see you this morning. I love Easter. I love when everyone dresses up, all the vibrant colors. I'm grateful the rain stopped for us. It's just a beautiful day. Uh, 300 miles from here, about as the crow flies, is a place that has recorded the hottest temperature on planet Earth. It was July 10th, I think it was 1913. It was a sizzling 134 degrees Fahrenheit in beautiful Death Valley. Uh, someone said on that day, a bird left to fly and died midair. I'm just like gnarly, right? And so I've had this kick in my life to go see all the national parks. And about a year ago, just over a year ago, I told my kids, I said, let's go to Death Valley. And, and then finally we got in the car and they said, dad, are you going to kill us? <laughs> like they just didn't, like, like they didn't understand. I actually, I think I have a picture of my family there, uh, Badwater Basin. I mean, if you look, it is just like brown and dirt and there is not much there in Death Valley. This is one of the lowest places on earth, uh, that last picture. And amazingly, all of that changed, all of that thing from Death Valley, that barren wasteland changed in 2005. Death Valley on average receives about like maybe an inch or two of rain a year. There was a stretch of 40 months where they received half an inch of rain. Half an inch in 40 months, almost four years. But in the winter of 2005, something happened. And during that winter, six inches of rain fell. And you saw the picture up on the screen and Death Valley bloomed. I mean, it turned into this beautiful scenery with the colors and the rocks and the flowers and everything was transformed. Visitors flocked to Death Valley to see this super bloom that you and I have heard of before. There was a guy, his name is uh, Sir Ken Robinson's, and in his TED talk, he suggested that we stop calling it Death Valley and we start calling it Dormant Valley. And he said, Death Valley isn't really dead. He said, it just needs the right conditions to thrive. And I wonder if you've ever thought about that in your life, that you just need the right conditions to thrive. Maybe you can think back to a child in one of your sports that you were playing. And you can think that it wasn't really going that great, but you got a new coach. And that soccer coach who spent a little more time with you on dribbling and a little more time with you on shooting, and you just fell in love with the game. Maybe you can think back to high school and you just struggled with your math teacher your, your, your freshman year and, and you just, you guys didn't connect. But that next year you got Miss Perry and Miss Perry, she just really invested in you. She cared about you and you started to enjoy math. I'm not saying you loved it, but you at least like got through it, you know. Maybe you can think back to college and you had a friend who, who gently nudged you one day and they said, hey, that relationship that you're in with Todd... It's not a good relationship. That guy's toxic for you. And you knew that he was toxic, but you just needed your friend to speak that truth into your life. Every single one of us has something inside of us that's dormant, that just needs the right conditions so that it will thrive. This Easter, we're going to look at an account in the Gospel of John that brings the hope of Jesus to the lives of those that he encountered. The story of Jesus is one of the most beautiful stories ever. But when we get to our passage in the Gospel of John, the disciples are beaten up. They're broken. They're hopeless. They feel purposeless. These guys have really been in one of the most difficult situations of their life. Their master, their leader, the one who they follow, was nailed to a cross and stuck in a tomb. And they walked away. That Friday feeling no purpose. They had to ask themselves, what have we done? What is going on here? And today you and I are going to look at John chapter 20 together and we're going to see some key points that stand out. We're going to see that the tomb that we've talked about that was empty was really not so empty at all. It was missing a body, but there was a clue left for you and I. And we're going to see how that clue brought hope when Jesus knows our name. We're going to see how Jesus speaks truth and peace into our lives. And we're going to see how Jesus says, you know what, if you're doubting, it's okay. 
You can still be in my presence. If you have a Bible, grab it with me. Open to John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. All the words will be on the screen. You can also use your app. There's a version Bible app. Uh, and you can follow along with everything that I'm going to be sharing there. But if you've been around someone who's a Christian, or if you've been around the church a long time, you've probably heard the comment, the tomb was empty. And that's true. The tomb was empty. There was no body to be found there on Easter morning. But in John chapter 20, John gives us a clue. And he says, eh, it's actually the not so empty tomb. Yeah, it's missing a body. I get that. He says that. But he says, there's something there that I need you to see. And John chapter 20 starts out, it tells us about this woman named Mary who went to anoint the body of Jesus. That was typical in this culture. She brought spices to go put it on the body. And when she got to the tomb, she realized that the stone had been rolled away from where the body was. This was not the grave or burial process that you and I know. On Thursday, I was down at Ivy Lawn. There was a man in our community who lost his mom, and I stood next to him shoulder to shoulder as we laid her body down in the ground. But in this culture, it was different. It was more like a cave that was in a rock. It was carved out that the body would go in. They would take a huge stone and roll it in front so no one could go in to disturb the body. But when Mary arrived, the Bible says that the stone was rolled away. And I want to let you know the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. It was rolled away so she could get in. It was already prepared for her. Listen to what John says in John chapter 20 verses 1 and 2. He says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. For her, the tomb was empty. If you notice, the first thing she does is she goes and gets the disciples. A lot of times when we don't know what to do in life, we call a friend. We say, hey, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Can you help me? Hey, I don't understand this situation. And as we go on, you're going to see that these guys said, What? And they got up, and the Bible says they basically had a foot race to the grave. And you'll see a difference in these guys. One of the guys' name is Peter, and he's kind of the guy who just like rushes into everything. Do any of you have a friend that just says yes to everything? And every now and then they say stupid things. It's fun seeing you guys look at each other right now. <laughs> Let you talk about that at lunch. Um, but Peter's this guy, he gets to the empty tomb and he just runs right in there. But the Bible says that John, he kind of stays outside. He's more of that inquisitor. He's like examining. I don't know if he would have made a good detective for Ventura PD, but he just kind of stays there. He seems more inquisitive. The Bible says that he comes in and he examines the grave and John writes that the grave clothes were laid exactly where the body was. He says that the grave clothes were in the exact same place after Jesus had been crucified. Notice that I say where the body was. It's where Jesus' body was laid. But the grave clothes are still in the same place. Something different. Something's going on. Scripture actually teaches you and I that Jesus resurrected from the grave. And no matter where you're at in your faith, I want you to remember this. Will you remember that Jesus was resurrected, not resuscitated? Think of that difference with me real quick. Jesus was resurrected from the grave. He wasn't resuscitated. A resuscitated body would have been laying down and would have gone, Ugh! right? Sat up, taken a deep breath, right? You've all seen the movie where it's like the dramatic scene, you know? And it would have disturbed the grave clothes, but John is very clear that the grave clothes were exactly where they had been. When you and I have a historical context of this time period, we understand better what's happening. A, a burial process in this time period took place differently in different areas. If you were in Egypt, which is just a couple hundred miles away, they would have taken 40 days to embalm the body. There's other nations that are close to Israel where they would have cremated the body. 
But in Jewish culture, they would take the body and they would pack spices around it and they would meticulously wrap it in grave clothes. I was even reading one scholar this week and he said up until the 1900s, they had maintained that same burial process for the last 1900 years. They had done the same thing that you and I are reading here as they had done in Israel. So when Mary comes out this morning, her intention is to add spices. She's going to go see what's going on. She goes to that tomb of the wealthy man. And John says that when he finally gets in there, that that body was not resuscitated because a resuscitated body would have taken the grave clothes with it. A resuscitated body would have disturbed the way that it was laid. And that's how you and I know that Jesus was resurrected. Listen to what John says in verses 6 and 8. 6 through 8. It says, Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Right? This is the guy that just runs into the building. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's actually John. He never says his name. He says, I'm the other disciple. I'm the one Jesus loved. It says he also went inside and he saw and he believed. John might not have fully believed in Jesus before this time. If you've ever read the Gospels, you'll notice that the disciples are confused about Jesus. Like, people ask questions and they're like, yeah. Like, they don't get it. They're like, Jesus, can you explain that again? Because Peter doesn't understand it, right? A little blame pointing, a little shift right there. I want you to think about the first time that you heard about Jesus. Maybe you were a little kid and it was in your home. And your parents had a little children's Bible, right? And they read those stories. You know, sometimes I'm like, why do we read the story of Samson to our children? I think we should probably change that one. <laughs> but they read stories and you got to this part where the grave was empty. And maybe as a child, you asked your parents, what does that mean for me? Maybe you can think about when you were a high school student and one of your friends said, hey, do you want to come to church with me? And you're like, what's church? And you're like, it's this place where they have free pizza and cute girls. And you're like, I'm in, <laughs> right? And you went and you sat in a room maybe like this. And maybe there were some songs and someone got up and opened the scripture. And maybe the guy's name was Pastor Rob and he preached the gospel to you. And you said, wow, that resonates with me. I need hope in Jesus. Maybe you were a college student and you can think about all those times and you finally got out of that toxic relationship and someone said, hey, there's a Bible study on campus with this ministry called Crew. And you're like, what's Crew? And you're like, it's this place where we go and study the Bible. It's where we talk about hope. And maybe it was in a small group that you had your Bible opened and it just seemed like one day that God's word came alive to you and you finally believed. That's what happened to John here. John says, I was traveling with Jesus for three years. I spent time with him. I watched him feed the hungry. I watched him care for the broken. I watched him accept everyone. He says, I was confused. But when I walked into that not so empty tomb, I believed. And maybe you're here today because you're looking for truth. And everything that's been going on in your life hasn't filled that gaping hole in your life. And today you said, I need Jesus. You can resonate. You can relate with the gospel writer here. We know the tomb is void of a body. And as the passage goes on in John chapter 20, it seems that Peter and John sort of leave. But Mary sticks around. Mary stays there. She's lonely. She's hurting. The Bible says that she's crying. My guess is she's lost purpose in her life. She's lost her Messiah. She doesn't know what to do. And while she's sitting there, the Bible says that there's two angels that are actually sitting in the tomb and they look to her and they say, why are you crying? And Mary is so brave. I don't know if you've noticed this, but for those of you who are following Jesus, uh, anytime in scripture when angels appear, people like fall face down. It says they are terrified. You read about a guy named Ezekiel. He's like, I fell face down. I was so scared. Daniel says, I got on my face. I didn't know what to do. 
we read about Mary that says there's two angels. She's like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> She's like, not scared. I'm like, how are you so brave? What is going on here? Listen to what God's word says in verses 11 and 12, if you don't believe me. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. She's so brave, she just responds. The angels must have left because the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us what happened next. But Mary turns around and she sees Jesus. Jesus is standing there in this location. I don't know how he gets there, he just appears. And Jesus speaks to Mary at first, but she doesn't recognize him. Why doesn't she recognize him? Because when you and I see someone die, we don't expect to see them three days later standing up talking to us. In Mary's mind, Jesus is dead. She's thinking in terms of death. She's thinking in terms of permanence. She's not thinking resurrected body terms. And so when Jesus approaches her, she has no framework for what is taking place. She has no concept for a resurrected body. And so when you and I find Mary and it says she's standing outside the tomb crying, she's crying because she's lost hope in everything. Her faith is gone. Her purpose in life is gone. Three days earlier, she saw Jesus hanging on a cross. And she has no concept for a resurrected body. But I want you to see, even though her faith is dead in verse 11, her faith is going to be resurrected when she talks to Jesus. Her faith is going to come back to life. And it's not until Jesus calls her by name. Listen as the story continues in verse 14. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. He speaks her name. When she realizes that it is Jesus, she cries again. She cries out. It's a different kind of crying. Why? Because Jesus knows her by name. I want you to know today Jesus knows you by name. Jesus knows every single one of your names. If you're taking notes, write this down. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to our lives. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to our life. Thank you. Say that again. Why has her life changed? Well, you, you, you just read it. In verse 11, she's broken. She's hurting. She's crying. But then Jesus speaks her name and it gives her hope for the day. It gives her hope for the shattered world that she finds herself in. Some of you, you have been longing for Jesus to call your name. And I just want to present this idea to you. What if your situation is similar to Mary's where Jesus has been calling your name, but you need to turn around and start listening? You need to stop listening to the things around you in this world and you need to turn around and say, who are you? Let Jesus speak truth into your life through your name. Uh, later today, we're going to have some people that are going to walk into the baptism and their life has been transformed. They have placed their hope in Jesus and they're going to have a public declaration today of what Jesus has done in their life. I remember when I was in my 20s and I placed my faith in Jesus and I was going to church, and the church said, hey, we're going to do baptisms. And I said, great. And, and I got to the baptism. We, we did it at this public pool. And, and I walked down to the pastor into the water, and he asked me if I had professed Christ as my Savior. And we had a quick conversation out there. And, and I just looked at him, and I said, hey, I've done some really bad things. Can you hold me under a little longer? <laughs> I just really want to make sure this works, okay? And some of us... We feel like if we've done bad things that God can't forgive us. And I want to let you know that Jesus knows your name. He knows what you've done. And he's standing right there next to you. He loves you deeply. 
If you feel like your faith is dead, he wants to resurrect it. He wants to give you purpose in your life today. Purpose that only comes from him. Now Mary takes this news of hope. You're going to see a pattern here. Mary's a hope dealer. She takes this news of hope and she goes and tells the disciples. Why? Because when we have good news, we go and share it, right? Like, like several years ago, think like 8, 10, 15 years ago, we would hear like, oh my gosh, there's a deal on a TV. Like you got to go to Walmart and get it. And now all the neighbors are talking. They're like, hey, avocados are on sale at Trader Joe's. Like you could eat this week, right? Like we go share truth because we want to share that truth with others. And Mary goes and runs and she finds the disciples. And it says that they have locked themselves in an upper room. This has been the most traumatic week of their life. This has been stress-filled. They're full of anxiety. They don't know what to do. And so what do they do? They create their own jail cell. We're not letting anybody in. We don't even know what to do. The Bible says they're so afraid they locked themselves in there out of fear. But then all of a sudden, Jesus just like, like shows up. L listen, to what, listen to what the scripture says in verse 19. It says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus' resurrected body has different worldly limits. The doors are locked and Jesus is able to appear right there, out of nowhere. He's standing in the room with them. It, 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 like, like I went to my barber yesterday and I got done and I said, oh, it looks so good. He said, it's like magic. And I was like, is that what Jesus did? Like, how did he, he just appears, right? Like, like it, he just shows up there in the room. And, and check this out. He comes and he just speaks this one word in the beginning. He says, peace. It's the Hebrew word. It's shalom. And Jesus speaks shalom over their life. It's not a simple hi or hello. And, and I want to expose a fault in our culture. It's a fault of me too. When we see someone, we greet them. We go, oh, hey, how are you doing? And you know, the reality is, is we don't care. So sad, right? We've just used it as a greeting. Oh, hey, how are you doing? And people are like, oh, well. And you're like, I don't have time for that. We, we don't care. But Jesus walks into their room. And he, when he says shalom, it's this powerful, he, it's this powerful uh, Hebrew greeting. It's very formal. It says, I care about you. It says, I'm speaking something new over your life. He says, I'm doing something different. Did you see the whole tone in the room changed? In, in verse 19, the disciples are fearful. And in verse 20, they are overjoyed like this. Why? Because peace drives out fear. When the peace of Jesus comes into your life, there's no room for fear to get there. The whole tone changes. If you were here on Friday night with us for Good Friday, it's this somber tone. And we show up here today and it's this whole new tone. It's this overjoyed. It's this peace. It's this life transformation. Because Jesus speaks peace into our lives. Listen as the story goes on in verse 21. I don't know if this will be on the screen. I might have wrote the wrong thing in my notes. But in verse 21, you can listen along. Listen, G again, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus do? He speaks peace over peace over peace. That's what he does. He says, you need peace. You guys need tons of peace. You need more peace. I think every single one of us in this room could say, yeah, there's an area of my life where I need peace. I, I have a group of pastors that uh, once a year I get away with. And, and we go do it. I, we, I call it small group for pastors. And we get away and we just talk about what God's doing in our life and our ministry and our family. And a couple months ago, we circled up on FaceTime and one of the guys said, hey, I don't think this is a really big deal, but uh, my wife went to the doctor on Monday, which was the day before we were talking, and, and he said they, f they found a lump on her breast. 
and, and he was super positive. He's like, oh, I think everything's going to be fine. I think we're okay. Like, we did some tests, you know, and we were like, hey, you need to follow up with us on that. Like, we need to know what's going on. And, and he seemed very peaceful. He seemed very calm about the situation. But four days later, he texted us, and he said, hey, guys, we just got done with the doctor, and it's breast cancer. And we were like, what? You just put that fearful situation, right? You, just, you get in this spot where you go, like, is anything going to get better? Like, can anything get worse? What's going to happen? And it was so cool to see all these different pastors chiming in and encouraging him. These guys sending Bible verses and, and helping him to, to understand and let him know we're here. And I wonder, are, do you, any of you feel like the disciples felt in verse 19? Do you just feel like your life is full of fear? Do you feel like you're struggling? Do you need the shalom of Jesus in your life? Maybe there's one person in here this morning and you're in a relationship that's failing. It could be a dating relationship. It, it could be a friend relationship. It could be your best friend since you were five years old. And you don't know exactly what's going on, but that relationship is failing. And every day you see it sliding away. And you just think to yourself, like, it's never going to get any better. Maybe today you just need Jesus to speak peace over your life. Maybe there's someone in here and, and you're doing school, right? You could be a high school student, college student, junior high, whatever kind of age you're in, wherever you're at. And, and you're taking this class and you're in this class. You're in, I don't care if it's chemistry, biology, math. I, I don't know what it is. It could be any class that you need to take and you just feel like you're behind. You go, I don't connect with the teacher. It's not working. I don't understand it. You're anxious, you're fearful, it keeps you up at night. And today, you just need the, you need the peace of Jesus. You need the peace of Jesus to come over you. Some of you are in the darkest season of parenting that you've ever been in. Right, when someone comes up to you and they go, hey, how are you doing? You're like, oh, it's so great, I'm so glad I have these three children. Right, and then at 2 a.m., you're like, Lord, why did you give them to me? <laughs> Like, I can't handle it anymore, right? Like, everyone's like, have kids, it's amazing. And then they, but they don't tell you that they, like, they, 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 they poop and it comes out of the side of their diaper and they spit their food out and, like, they bother you at 2 a.m. and you don't get to sleep anymore. And then you're supposed to go and everyone's like, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm so good, it's amazing. <laughs> and you know what? You're just praying for the peace of Jesus at 2.30 in the morning. You know, some of, I've, I've said this before, some of the, the most like ongoing repetitious prayers I have ever prayed in my life are, God, will you please let my kids sleep through the night? <laughs> Why? Because I needed peace. And maybe you feel like you're in that situation today and you are begging God for peace. I want to let you know that you can get peace from Jesus. You can find peace in this place. You can find peace in his word. I'll tell you where you're not going to find it. You can't pull up your app on Amazon and say, can you just deliver 20 pounds of peace to my house? <laughs> right? You're not going to go to Target or CVS today and be like, hey, look, peace is on sale next to the Easter candy. Right? Like, <laughs> it's not going to be there. But it's here. It's in the midst of Jesus. And I'll tell you this, is there's going to be times that you are in the darkest, most fearful situations of your life. And Jesus is going to show up out of nowhere. And he's going to say, shalom. And he wants to give you his peace. Listen with me to what the Apostle Paul said. You don't have to turn there. Just let me read Romans chapter 5, verse 1. God's word says this. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are saying, that sounds really good today, Neil. I want peace. I want that peace of Jesus. And he offers it to you. It's available to you today. You just have to accept it. Okay, so far we've seen that the tomb is not so empty. Jesus knows Mary's name. He brings peace to the disciples. And I want to look at one more encounter where our story kind of concludes today in chapter 20, because the power of the resurrection isn't over. There's another story here in John 20. It's a man named Thomas. And some of you, maybe you have heard of him. Uh, if you've been around the church, you've heard of him as doubting Thomas. And, you know, it's kind of a fair, unfair statement about him. But I'll tell you this is Thomas struggled. 
and he was a doubter. But Thomas was also courageous, loyal, and devoted. Later today, I invite you to read John chapter 11. And Jesus says, hey, my friend Lazarus is dead, but things aren't good for us in the town that he lives in. And Thomas thinks about it for a second. He says, all right, let's go and we'll die too. He's courageous. He's devoted. He's loyal to Jesus. But he reminds me of Eeyore. You know Eeyore, right? Right? Tigger's bouncing around on his tail. He's like, come on, Pooh, let's go. And Eeyore's like, I guess we can do it. You know, he's always just gloomy, right? They even, like, just look at the way Disney drew his eyes. Look at the color of the character. That's kind of like Thomas. He's a little more like Eeyore. He's gloomy. He's down. And when we meet Thomas in John chapter 20, he's not a doubter anymore. Thomas is a full-on unbeliever. Thomas has completely rejected his faith. He doesn't even believe in Jesus. Listen to what God's word says in verses 24 and 25. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. He wasn't there when Jesus showed up and brought peace. And so the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, he says, I will not believe. I'll tell you this, Thomas is about to get his wish. He's about to get his opportunity to see the resurrected body of Jesus. But before we get there, I just want to talk about Thomas's life. Why wasn't he with the disciples in verses 19 through 23? Where is he? Well, he's completely abandoned his faith. He's completely walked away from Jesus. He spent three years of his life following Jesus. He gave everything to it. But then he went into Jerusalem and he saw them arrest Jesus unfairly. He saw them take him to an unfair, unjust midnight courtroom. He saw Jesus beaten and he heard that they were going to hang him on the cross. And he said, peace, I'm out. I don't want to be there too. And he left. But you know what's amazing? Is the disciples rallied together and they said, hey, where's Thomas? And no one at church said, oh, you know, Thomas walked away from the Lord. And someone else said, well, that's just his lot in life. I guess no one will ever love him. No, you know what the disciples did? They said, we're out. We're going to go get Thomas. We're going to go bring him back. Why? Because Thomas is one of us. We say something about this church. We say this is a safe place to learn about God. And I don't care where you're at in your spiritual journey. You might be sitting in here today and you say, I don't believe in this God thing one bit. You might be saying, hey, my heart's actually warming to God. You might be saying, hey, I believe in Jesus, but my faith has been dead for a while. You might be saying, hey, I love God with my whole heart. Guess what? No matter where you're at, you belong here. We want you to learn about the great things of Jesus. Because if they just let Thomas wander around on his own, if they just let Thomas walk away, you and I would never read this story that we're going to read about today. Okay, okay, sorry, I'll stop preaching. Go back to the room. So the doors are locked. Once again, and once again, you're going to see Jesus break the law of physics. Jesus is a pursuing God. Listen to what happens in verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. He does it again. He says, let me give you peace. You know, I've talked to people. I've been a pastor for almost 20 years now. And I hear people all the time, they say, oh, God is angry with me. And you know what's so wild? And what you and I read here, Jesus sounds more like Mother Teresa than Mike Tyson. I don't see an angry God. I see a God who's coming to people in their distress. I see a God who cares deeply for people. I see a God who speaks peace over people's life. I don't see a God who comes to Thomas and says, what did you say about me? He doesn't say that. He just walks in and he says, peace. Remember Thomas said, I'm not going to believe in Jesus unless I poke my finger in there. Okay, okay, just real quick. How many of you have ever seen like a bloody gash and you're like, I want to put my finger in that. (laughs) I mean, that sounds like a 14 year old boy to me, right? Like, but that's Thomas's like negotiation tactic. Listen to what happens in verses 27 through 29. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. 
reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas shoved his fist into Jesus' side. Is that what your Bible says? (laughs) Because mine doesn't. Mine says Thomas said to him, I envision Thomas, he threw up his hands in surrender, white flag, right? He says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas makes the most profound profession of faith in the entire New Testament. He says, you're my Lord and my God. I almost envision Thomas falling on the ground. What have I said? What have I done? So who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus just a good guy who makes good people? Is Jesus just a good guy who does nice things? Is he some historical figure that people wrote fictitious books about? Maybe things got blown out of proportion. A couple people got just a little too emotional. Or are you like Thomas and is Jesus your savior? Is he the one who you long for, who brings you hope? Remember what I said earlier? I asked you to write this down. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to our lives. If Jesus isn't your savior, today I invite you to place your faith in him. Make the profound profession that Thomas does. Just say, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my God. I need you. I need hope. It's really that simple. I think we live in this culture where we we try to make it harder than it is. We go like, oh, there's something I have to do. I have to do this or do that. And Jesus says, no, you have to believe. That's what you do is you believe. I want you to think back to my opening story on Death Valley. Those flowers, those seeds were always there. They just needed the right conditions to thrive. And I want you to know that Jesus has always been closer to you than you thought. Jesus has always been in earshot. He's shown up in places that maybe you didn't expect him to show up in. And there is something inside of you where your faith needs to be resurrected today so you can bloom like Death Valley bloomed in 2005. I want you to know that Jesus wants you to flourish. Jesus knows the greatness that's inside of you. He knows who you are. He created you. God's word says that he knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs that are on your head. And today he wants you to place your faith in him. And many of you, you've done that. You've said, I'm living for Jesus. I love him. But maybe there's a couple of you today that you're saying, yeah, I actually need to place my faith in Jesus. And in just a minute, I'm going to close in prayer. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to place your faith in Jesus. Because the resurrection of Jesus brings hope in our lives. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me? Jesus, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for this resurrection Sunday that we get to celebrate the hope that you bring to us. And Lord, there is maybe one person in here, maybe several people in here who need to place their faith in you. They've been living hopeless. Maybe they lost their faith. Maybe they never had faith but they need to be like Mary and cry out to you. They need peace spoken over their lives like the disciples. They're gonna emphasize that you are their Lord and God. And if you can resonate with what we read in scripture today and you wanna place your hope in Jesus, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer that's just between you and God. And in your mind, you can have a conversation with God. And you just say something like this if you wanna place your faith in Jesus. You just say, God, I believe in you. You don't have to say it out loud. You say, Jesus, today I'm placing my hope in you. Jesus, I believe that you lived a sinless life. Jesus, I believe you came to save me from my sins. I believe you went to the cross to save me. And I believe that grave is empty. Today, I'm placing my hope in you. Today, I trust in you, Jesus. With everyone's eyes closed and heads bowed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, will you raise your hand so I can rejoice with you? Awesome, I see you. Awesome, I see you. Love it, love it. Great. Okay, I see you over there. Anyone else? Okay, I see you. Awesome, I see you in the back. Love it. 
You can put your hand down. If you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus, to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, I encourage you, tell someone. Hijack the lunch conversation today. Say, hey, I heard this sermon from this handsome pastor and my life is transformed. (laughs) Tell somebody about the good things God is doing. Be like Mary and go bring hope. Lord, I pray that you would use us as a church family to live in the power of the resurrection. Lord, I pray for those who walked in here today like the disciples feeling fearful. Jesus, would you speak a powerful truth over their life? Holy Spirit, would you do a new work in us? Would you guide us? Would you intercede for us? Would you do a transformative work in our life? Jesus, just as you breathed the Holy Spirit on the disciples, would you pour out your Holy Spirit on us? We need you, Jesus. We pray these things in the most precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing one more song, and we're also going to baptize some people. And so those of you who are going to get baptized, if you want to go and get changed, and if God's stirring in your heart, and you're like, hey, I'm a Christian, I've never been baptized, if you want to get baptized today, we'll walk you right in that tub. And we'll let you get baptized right now. You can connect with one of our elders. Uh, I'll be over there too in a second. But why don't you stand, let's sing this song, and then in a couple minutes we'll baptize.
you can go ahead and have a seat. I just want to quickly talk about baptism. Uh, in Matthew 28, it's the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus commissions the disciples. It's not the great suggestion, it's the great commission. He says, go, make disciples. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And today we got a couple people who we're going to do that for. And they're going to get baptized. They're going to make this public profession of their faith. And they're going to come up here. And so we're doing that. But these people are also getting baptized in like following what Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 3, you'll see that you can go read. Jesus walks down to the Jordan River. And he gets baptized by his cousin John. But in Titus chapter 3 in the New Testament, we read that you are not saved by righteous things that you are done. And so I never want anyone to think that you're saved by going into the waters of baptism. You're only saved by the power of Jesus. And so I'd like to invite our two people up who are going to get baptized. You guys can meet me over at the tub. If there's anyone else and you feel like, hey, man, I'm a Christian, but I've never been baptized. If you want to get baptized, just feel free to walk on over and uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you in over there too. So this is your opportunity to take that next step of faith. And if you're worried about like, oh, clothes or what am I going to do? We got towels and shirts. Don't worry about that. this morning the Holy Spirit's pulling on those those heart strings and saying it's your time to get baptized on this Easter Sunday can we just sing this one more time we're gonna sing the enemy thought he had me but Jesus said you're mine just last time together can we all stand as we sing this Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said you are mine. The enemy, the enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said you are mine. Come on. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said.
Wasn't it great to be able to celebrate new life in Christ? If you have come to faith in Christ and you have not yet been baptized, we want to help you take that next step in your journey. So you can talk to any staff member. You can let us know you're interested by filling out the baptism interest form on our church center app. But we want to help you uh, wherever you're at in your journey with Christ take that next step. Well, I have just a couple of things before we go out. Uh, if you are new with us today, we would love for you to join us at what we call our seven-minute meetup. This is a quick way for you to meet some of the leaders here at Coastline, to learn a bit more about Coastline, and to be able to ask any questions that you might have about Coastline. Today, that is taking place in our lobby. You're just going to exit these center doors, and there's a little alcove in the lobby, and that's where uh, you will find Pastor Neil and, I believe, Teller. Uh, so if you are new, please please join us for the seven-minute I mean, if we have a special gift, we'd like to give you just for coming. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you for joining us uh, at, for our Easter service. If you have not uh, utilized our photo wall, we would love for your family to get a picture um, at our photo wall. That's going to be open after the service. If you post uh, your picture on social, be sure to tag us. Also, I think there's some leftover food. And parents, there are bounce houses in the gym. So they will be open until about noon. This will be a great opportunity to let your kids burn off all of that energy from the Easter candy they've eaten. And it's a great opportunity for you to get to visit with some of our other parents at Coastline. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would cool in Jesus.